I'm uh, Dan, I'm a uh, VP R&D at Cytix. We are actually located, located here in uh, the 15th floor. So you can uh, jump over if you want. Um, a little bit about what we are doing, just to give uh, a context to what I'm going to talk about. Um, basically, we are working with platform manufacturer that in order to make the platform autonomous. Uh, we are oriented into deep learning computer vision uh, for uh, SWOPC uh, systems. What does it mean, SWOPC, if uh, people are not familiar with the term, it's a size, weight, power, and communication. That means that the platform we work on are uh, small, <laughs> have small power consumption, uh, CPU and GPU are very limited, and there is no communication back home. Um, which is a problem because deep learning is basically developed by academy uh, researchers that want they want to have to, to have the pub, the paper published means they want to have the best results so usually uh, most of the research is done on servers either on premise or in the cloud very strong um, computers very big uh, models uh, if you've seen like daily dali 2 dali either dali is very big and cannot run on your iPhone. Um, so this is where we come. We uh, help companies uh, to do deep learning computer vision on uh, the edge uh, without communication back to servers. Uh, for example, a task uh, for a search and rescue. Uh, if we want to scan this area and find uh, a lost person, if you do it manually, this is what actually we are, they are doing now. Uh, it takes a lot of time. You need an AP operator per uh, drone, uh, and it's really not efficient. There is someone wounded and you want to save him. Um, there is in the circle a person with his dog. If you zoom in, you will see it. Um, and our job is to make the drones autonomous, do the task autonomously, and detect the person and uh, report back. Uh, excuse me, I have yes. a uh, Will you please go back in that slide? Just to understand, so uh, if you have a drone, so what will be the distance, minimum distance, so, uh, to identify, limit? Well, it's, it depends on so many factors. It depends on the platform manufacturer. What They have different platforms, different payloads, yeah. different tasks. So uh, we work also with companies that do uh, satellite uh, images, yeah. uh, so it can be from space also. It depends on so many factors. In, in pictures, from, for us, it's, uh, I see only the, like a stone. So you ask, what is the size of the object? No. To detect the size, what is the limit of the distance of the drone from the ground to uh, the uh, height? So, so usually what we say is the, the limit yeah. is the number of pixels per target. And uh, if you talk about distance, usually what we care about is horizontal distance, yeah. because then you have a lot of atmosphere to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, usually when you are elevated, the atmosphere doesn't uh, bother you so much, besides clouds. But, but uh, only the uh, trees, no? Yeah, well, if there are trees, uh, in computer vision it's hard to see. Uh, you can use other uh, systems, uh, but computer vision help only if you can see the target, yes. That's true. <laughs> you, you develop this uh, solution, or your company takes deep learning models, optimize them, quantize them, whatever, and give them back to the manufacturer? Obviously, we believe in uh, uh, riding on giant bags, so we are not developing from scratch the models. We go from uh, uh, known architectures, uh, and then we develop them to fit to our needs because our needs are a little bit unique. Usually if you go, uh, your models need to compete in, uh, to have the best score on Coco. And Coco is, you have uh, uh, images with large objects and we have very small objects. Um, we, our search and rescue uh, platform usually work at night. So the, it's thermal images, uh, it, it looks different, the resolution is different. 
Uh, so there are many factors that you need to adapt the architecture to your needs, uh, but uh, we don't build all the layers by ourselves. We start from something which we know works good, and then we adapt it to our, our needs. Uh, but that's only a model. At the end of the day, we'll, I'll get to it now. Um, so we are in MLOps uh, community meetup, and the question, what is MLOps? Um, so I just Googled MLOps, and uh, it's one sentence from different pages I found. Uh, so it's helping deploy models, uh, automate process, transition of models from one phase to another, bridge the gap between data scientists to production team, help data scientists that doesn't know what to do uh, in order to help them test. Um, so I think this is a false example uh, to what is MLOps, because I have, uh, this is my screen on the right, uh, we're using uh, ClearML, they have a representative here, um, which I had it already two years ago, but this is not MLOps. This is cool, I can see my experiments, uh, I uh, spin up machines, spin down machine based on uh, what I need, but this is for me not MLOps. As VP R&D, it's not valid enough as MLOps, um, because what happens when this is the uh, uh, definition of MLOps, uh, what you are doing is steering data all the time. You have new data, you have old data, you're steering it. Uh, you find, you hope for the best results, and if the result doesn't feel, uh, uh, fit what uh, you want, then you steer it again. And in the middle, you just stack MLOps solution, uh, which uh, you take uh, um, maybe data monitoring or management uh, solution, you take uh, experiment management solution, you stack them, and you have cool graphs and uh, automation, but this is still not MLOps. Um, so what I think is MLOps? Um, I, I like uh, the, the images on the right, so this is why I put them there. Um, it started back uh, a few years ago. They had two, cir two circles, uh, develop and ops. Later on, they uh, grew into three circles. Uh, they say you have uh, the stage of machine learning, then development, then ops. And lately, they started to have four circles, <laughs> data, machine learning, development, and ops. Um, so I'm more, uh, uh, I'm wondering if there will be five and six uh, with year, the years, I'm not sure. Um, but for me, MLOP is a tool chain that help you manage the entire life cycle of machine learning solution. It's not just models. People talk about models all the time, but my solution has several models, several flows, there is also uh, other stuff other than models, there is a code that my uh, software engineers write, uh, and I need to manage the entire life cycle of the, of the development of the R&D. Uh, so if we ask, if uh, I ask myself, what is MLOps? This is the definition. I manage the entire life cycle and the work in the company from data collection till uh, deployment uh, and feedback back into data collection. This is, uh, I, we have ISO in the, whoever is uh, familiar with the term ISO. Uh, so they make me do this kind of uh, charts. Uh, but this just give an example of the, the flow that happens, be, even all these uh, parts, it's just data. There's still no model in the loop, and I need to manage everything. Uh, and if the and the models uh, part is this section, and the last part is uh, software integration testing. Um, so when I uh, try to define what MLEPs do in my company, I have a workflow of the entire uh, operation in the company, uh, the entire. All my employees in the R&D department I need to be uh, fitted into my workflow, and then I need to manage the entire process. Um, uh, and this is a, an example. Uh, I, I don't get into the chart in the right. It's just to see that we decided only for the data to 
and look at the entire process. What happens to the data? The data doesn't stay only in the machine learning uh, department or, or section. I'm doing a collection plan. If I don't have data, I'm not in the academy, I don't have a data set that I use. I need to collect data all the time. I need to plan how to collect what to, what to collect. Uh, I need to, to make the data collection. Um, so if I, you, you saw before examples of person and dog, so I, uh, we have kind of a, a, a movies department in the company. We rent uh, motorcycles, boats, cars, people, and we make movies in different areas in the world. Um, so I need to plan and I need to make sure these data collection events are part of my MLOps uh, solution. Uh, data pipeline, um, data annotation, data registration into database, model training, and version performance analysis. These all parts are only in the data section before anything ever happened. Um, and why is it important to, to uh, process the entire, uh, to analyze the entire process of data? Because many times, <laughs> You don't have enough data. Uh, so if you want to have a solution that works for uh, autonomous vehicles, then you have uh, images from US roads, and then you deploy your platform, and this is what it sees. And if you don't have this kind of data in your model, it will not do, know what to do. And sometimes the, the data just doesn't fit, because here we want to detect vehicles, and, but the vehicles in India, you have rickshaws and you have cows also in the road and you have these uh, ponds in the road and you need to be able to, uh, to work in these kind of conditions. So if you don't analyze your data, monitor data, monitor your model performance, its weakness, uh, performance, uh, uh, weakness spots, strength spots, you don't have the possibility to really have MLOps, which means you have a feedback loop, you have a version uh, uh, deployed, you get a false positive, false negative, you feed it back into your data collection and, and go back again. Um, also data annotation, it's not stuck, it's something there at the data team and the machine learning guys doesn't care. Uh, this is just an example of a, an issue that we had, we needed to detect uh, openings, uh, doors and windows. So the annotator says that that's easy. I have a uh, re rectangle uh, for the opening. But if this is what you annotate, basically your machine learning model sees the back one, doesn't see it. So it sees a bench and trees and you try to, tra to train it to detect trees as an opening. So what is an opening? Is it the hole? Uh, is it the frame and the all? Does it include the door also? Uh, it's, it's not very easy. And if you want your model to, to do what it aims to do, you need the entire process. We have an auto automatic process that annotate, that take samples of data uh, from the data collection during the data pipeline, shows it to the uh, ML engineer, um, ask them for direction for annotations. Annotators, when they annotate data, samples go back into machine learning guys to say, okay, it's good, it's not good. Uh, you are talking uh, about manual work. It's not uh, automated. The, 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 who is annotating the picture? The annotation done uh, basically manually, otherwise you don't need a model because <laughs> you have a model that's doing it. But the, the, the process, managing the entire process, the process of annotation is done manually, but feeding the annotators, everything is done automatically. So we have a process that the moment, even the data collection, it's manually, someone goes, take a camera and film people working in the field. But once it comes to, it comes to into the company, basically before they go to the field, they, I need to let them uh, write down what is the metadata, what is the metadata about the scene that they were, was it the dawn, the sunrise, night, was it the urban scenario, 
there's a the need to I need to have all this metadata with the data. When they come to my office, they put it into our gateway, data gateway, and from there everything is automatic. It's been analyzed, uh, separated into frames, uh, going into annotation automatically. When the annotators finish and they upload uh, the, annotate, the annotation files, automatically I detect it and it goes back into my data registration. So everything is automatic. People are doing manual work as annotators because we are not doing it in-house. But the process is automatic. There is no man in the loop to trigger the events. Uh, it's done automatic besides the, the person that puts the data in the gateway uh, to the company. Uh, so yes, if we didn't need annotators, then we'll have the models, you know, <laughs> that basically the, the problem. <laughs> Um, so that we talked about data process. Uh, we have also analyzed the model's life cycle. So models doesn't live in one place also. So the data team uh, need to do the train val test split before the ML, ML guys can uh, train their models. There is the model training. Uh, when we have the best model, we, our data guys check that there is no data contamination. You need to check if your model uh, by accident was trained on the validation or on the test. So we, they, we take the model, we check all the frames that were used to create this model, and we make sure they are not, as, uh, there is no frame that appears in the validation or in this test. And it's easy when it's only a model, but when, when you have a cycle, and uh, because it's maybe the model that is the output of the training process uh, started with an input model from the previous version. So you need to go back uh, to all the phases of training, to all the training uh, cycles, and check that there is no one frame in the entire process that was in the validation test. We have hyperparameter optimization of the models, obviously. Um, uh, we are compiling the model into uh, on NX, and then it depends on the hardware that we are working on. Uh, model testing, uh, it needs to go to the company artifactory. We don't take it manually from the ML guys. It goes from once the ML guy chose the, the best model, it goes into automatically into our artifactory with all the metadata and all the information about the model. Uh, from there, it goes into uh, integration with our software, because the software is a bunch of models. We have models for object detection and classification and key point uh, extraction and segmentation, um, re-identification. We have several models that we are used in our solution. We have diff different flows in the system. And uh, all these models go integrate as part of the CI uh, into testing. I will get into the grade one uh, soon, because this is an issue of edge AI. Uh, but all of this uh, uh, process, once we analyze it, we can define how things move from one place to another with their metadata and being uh, uh, automatically tested. You have the examples in the future slides of like all the, the system that you use, or uh, did you write it in now? Um, so we use ClearML. Just for example, uh, oh, what? I believe it's in right? No, no, actually, no. Our artifactory is JFrog. Uh, we're using JFrog. Our CI is uh, GitHub Action. Uh, but it, the system itself, whether it's ClearML or Weight and Biases, uh, if you use uh, GitHub Action or whatever, uh, what I'm trying to say is the tools, uh, they are just tools. If you don't analyze the entire process and automate and make sure that you know how things moved from one place to another with their metadata. Uh, this is the, the hard part of MLOps. Uh, there are a lot of solution, uh, but you need to analyze the process from end to end and then to automate it. And the connection between uh, the different teams and different phases of development are the hard ones to, to gap. Basically build the orchestration between all the solutions? Yes. 
there is a lot of discussion between the software guys and the deep learning guys. What, how do I uh, make sure that all the metadata about the models is transferred so they can use it when they compile the model into a Snapdragon uh, model? Uh, what is the input uh, size, input shape, uh, all the factors, what is the quantization th that you need? Uh, so everything needs to be defined. What is the, is it a JSON or a YAML that goes with every, every model? How it goes automatically? Where does it go? Uh, you need to analyze everything and then orchestrate it. So that was about deep learning. Uh, when you go into Edge AI, you have more problems because usually if it's, it's not AGI, you use, this is an A100 uh, NVIDIA uh, board. It's uh, about 400 watt, uh, which make a lot of, of noise in our uh, uh, servers room. Uh, but our solution works on this kind of, uh, uh, it's called SOMS. Um, either Qualcomm, NVIDIA, Intertiger Lake, Halo, Israeli company, really cool. Um, and the problem is that First of all, you need to compile your models into something they, need, they know how to work with. And every hardware manufacturer has its own tool chain. And every hardware manufacturer has its, its own set of layers they support. A layer that runs on Intel Tiger Lake doesn't mean it will run on Qualcomm. It doesn't mean it will run on Halo. You need to make sure that if you want to be, uh, and this is what I have, and as a VP R&D, I don't want to have a version for each hardware, a, ver a version for each operating system. I want my software to run everywhere. So I need to make sure, and my machine learning guys, they cannot, the CI fails if the model cannot compile to all this hardware. And if they need to change the models, the pre-processing, the post-processing, the layers, in order to make it run and compile, they will do it, otherwise it cannot pass into the system. Uh, so this is uh, just another complication in the deep learning world. Uh, most of these chips doesn't work on float 32. Uh, usually int 8, maybe float 16, it's, that's the range. Uh, sometimes int 16. Hmm? Big float 16. Yes. Uh, but no one, always, almost no one runs on uh, uh, float uh, 32, so you need to do quantization. Um, um, you need to make sure that uh, the CPU resources that they are using, um, uh, that you are util utilizing the CPU uh, as much as possible in order to make sure that you run uh, uh, efficiently. Um, you need to make sure that your models can go into the GPU, you don't uh, copy the models and every uh, frame that comes into the, in the system. So you want all the models to be copied at init into the, into the GPU, and there is so much uh, memory in this kind of uh, uh, system. So this is something that you need to check, and you check what is the utilization, how much of the GPU is still empty, and can you load them all into the GPU. And what do you want You want to run in the GPU and what on the DSP? Um, and then you need to check that your FPS and latency are valid to your uh, use case. Um, so these are all issues that usually come in Edge AI because if you have a, as strong computer as you want, you just have a stronger computer and it will run fast. Uh, in Edge AI, you need to make sure, and if not, the model is not valid. You need to replace the model, not the hardware. Um, and if the latency is too slow, then you cannot maybe do some uh, manual, uh, uh, remote manual uh, operation. Um, another issue is that when you test your model, if you decide, we, we talked about looking at the, at, the, at the entire process, the process need to include hardware in the loop testing. Because testing on in the cloud it does, is not good enough. You need at the end to compile on the edge device to run on the edge device to time the inference time, the, the latency, the CPU. You need to monitor everything, 
and you need your R, you need to have an edge lab. We have an edge lab in our, in the same server room. Next to the training machine, we have uh, edge devices from all types, and we make sure that not only the performance uh, of accuracy, mid-level precision, whatever, uh, but also CPU, GPU, latency, up, up runtime, and everything. Um, Are you monitoring the model performance as well in, uh, you know, when, once the product is uh, shipped? Yeah, so when it's already shipped or before it's shipped? No, when it's shipped, when you can, I don't know, like uh, get it back and you can see like the history and... Uh... It's, it's a good question because unfortunately in our, uh, with our users, um, it's called what, what it's called air gap. Uh, we have no, there cannot be any communication between us and them. Uh, this is a unique AJI usage. Uh, so they need to feed us back. And uh, we, we make sure that our hardware can record images and can record logs. And we give them the, the ability to send us back home first positive, first negative logs. Uh, because we want to train back on these uh, examples. Um, but this is done manually by them uh, because, because it's ergap. Uh, we cannot communicate with the, uh, with the, with the systems. Uh, so we talked about hardware in the loop. Uh, we are doing end-to-end -end testing at the end. But model. Before uh, shipping your product also, you need to uh, verify the things, no? the things that you have put. Yeah, yeah, so I talked about hardware in the loop testing. I'm also doing testing of end-to-end, -end. Uh, as we said before. Yeah. I have a bunch of models, that's cool. I have the per performance of each model by itself. But my performance of my system is the entire pipeline of pre-processing, post-processing, all the models together, my tracking algorithm. Everything have an influence on the performance. So yeah. my, my end, my, what, what, for your question, at the end, when I have a version uh, ready for deployment, I am I'm testing it end to end with everything, and my my KPIs is the performance on the edge device, mm -hmm. on the hardware, and not what the machine learning guys gave me as the model's performance. No, but uh, you have the model, and when you ship that one, maybe there may be some uh, malfunction, and how the users will uh, report to you if you don't have the Logins? Uh, no, I have. I have my 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 solution yeah. enables. Uh, there is debug mode uh, in my solution, mm -hmm. and you can trigger it, and it records videos and images and logs and everything, and I let them record data and ship it to me. Wow. But because it's air gap, I cannot do it automatically, which I think this is what you were aiming for. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Well, I'm just ask if you monitoring the you know for retraining. Yeah, yeah. So I'm monitoring it using my users because I cannot do it automatically because they are air gapped, but uh, so this is the only way I can do it. Um, so this is why I said it's cross company MLOps solution. ClearML usually only the ML engineer have ClearML. I have a, a user from all departments, all, basically all of them, data, uh, DevOps, software, uh, machine learning engineers, all of them use my ClearML account. We have, I have users for everyone because the data engineers register the data into the uh, uh, ClearML database. Uh, my machine learning guys train the models there, spin up and down machines based on it. My DevOps guys make sure that the CI takes the model from there and take the information on the data into my JFrog. And my software guys use it in the end-to-end -end test. They use the ClearML to take down the data that is the test data, which is registered on ClearML, and is testing it on the edge device. So everything, if you have an MLOps solution, you need to make sure, if not everyone is using it in the entire pipeline, then you probably will have uh, problems. <laughs> um, it's like a cycle. It's, it's like a cycle. Exactly. And you need to make sure that everyone is using the same system because otherwise they will have one test set and they will have another test set and we have, we've been there. Um, we have another unique 
phase in our uh, development, which is on platform testing, not only in the lab, but also in the field. Uh, on platform testing, uh, so it's two phases. On platform testing, it's including the entire drone, let's say, because my solution also controls the payloads. Uh, it's not just analyzing data. Uh, so I need to make sure that I didn't win anything. So I can also check that my control of the payload works. Uh, so I need the entire system uh, uh, to test my solution in the entire system. And the next phase is on, in the field because um, there, is, there is, when you take your, your system after you trend it and you think, oh, it looks cool, you take it to the field and this drone is jumping around. And if it's a, a rolling shutter, it's not a global shutter, then you have some effects on the, on the targets. Um, and implementation and observation. Exactly. Um, so if you take everything, if you manage to uh, analyze your entire process, uh, so we, we build a, a solution. It's our internal tool chain. It's called, we call it AI Dojo. Um, and we make sure that the entire process is automated as much as possible. As you said before, the annotation is here. It's manual. Uh, Semi-automatic, it, semi it means that we are pre-annotating it. If we have a previous model for the same product, then we can help an the annotators with pre-annotation. But it's only uh, to give them a hint. At the end, they need to do the manual work. Uh, but other than that, um, we make sure that everything is triggered and uh, managed manually. Um, and why is it important? Because uh, we believe that uh, we don't know what we don't know, which means everything looks nice in the lab. Uh, but at the end of the, the day, uh, in real life, if you are working with, uh, uh, we work with a platform that go around in wild area and we never know what they will encounter. Um, we want to iterate fast and to fail fast. Uh, because if I go and my, I detect a, a dog as a person, uh, I want this image back, as you said, and to release a new version as fast as possible. Um, so we have a, our SDLC, Software Development Lifecycle Protocol, uh, is six weeks for every version release. So every six weeks, we gather data, we train models, we add new features to, the, to our uh, uh, product. We are doing QA testing, uh, bug fixes, uh, updating our documentations, uh, testing uh, on the, uh, in the lab, uh, and then we go with it after six weeks into testing in the field uh, and ship it to our uh, users. So I am a strong believer of uh, failing fast. Uh, and this is why we need to automate. If you don't automate the entire process, there is, it's very hard to make sure that you have a version delivery every six weeks. And we also make sure that the uh, delivery, the, the version, the deployed version, we have all the KPIs from all departments, uh, data, uh, uh, software research, uh, so we can monitor if my models, if my so solution getting better or worse. Because sometimes you add data and you get worse results. Or you add, added a feature that made the tracker work uh, worse. So we need to track everything and make sure that we don't deploy our CI is not approved if the version is not better than the previous version on the same test set. Uh, and then the end, we have a feedback loop. Uh, feedback loop is manually. Uh, we get uh, automatic report of all the performance weakness report and with this we this we decide what we'll do in the next six weeks oh, i've got a question yeah finished so <laughs> the drones where would they go in the field Thank you. they have communication to anywhere else they don't do they it, it's it depends on our user some users have the problem, or it's not a problem, it's good for us, this is our business, <laughs> because we work with the companies that they have drones already, uh, but they work it uh, manually. You have a manual operator 
we usually they have a kind of a tablet or a, or a laptop and, and they operate the drones and we come to them and say, let's make it uh, as autonomous as possible. Uh, they still want to have a control usually, so usually they have a link, but if there is a loss of link or if they need to work autonomously, uh, it's possible. Uh, so we enable them some, I don't have example here, but we, I showed the, the opening before. Mm -hmm. The opening issue was that one was launched and getting into a building and the communication didn't work for these users. So they wanted the, they'd want to get into the building automatically, see if the opening is open or closed, if the door is closed uh, or the window is closed, get from, it's scanning the, the building, find the opening, get inside, scan the entire uh, building and get outside because when it's inside, the communication didn't work well enough. Uh, so it depends on the usage and the user. Okay, so in case of an autonomous drone, the inference is made on the spot, right? But we believe, uh, this is what we do, everything we do is the inference is on the spot, is on the drone. Uh, for several reasons, one because uh, we want to be uh, to make sure that it swaps it. We don't have, uh, we don't want to now send uh, all the information backwards uh, to run somewhere that I cannot rely on it. Uh, also, when you are there near the payload, you can get the raw data. You have, uh, uh, if you are using thermal images, you have sometimes uh, 12 bit, uh, 16 bit uh, uh, data, and when you send it back, usually. It's 8-bit because the user, which is viewing it on a screen, get an 8-bit, you know, it's uh, 256 uh, gray levels. But we want as much information as possible. I don't want it to be compressed and sent uh, in a communication link, which is usually very narrow. So I'm working everything, I'm doing everything on the edge, on the platform, no communication back at all. Uh, and if the user itself wants to send communication, it's his uh, decision, but I'm making sure that everything is uh, contained on my chip. So if the drone goes and it finds something, it can communicate on the spot that is found something? Again, it depends on the, uh, I'm not using, I'm not doing the, the product itself, the drone, I'm doing only the so autonomous. How does it work? So it's, 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 it's the jungle, it finds something. But yeah, so it depends. If, if it's the building example that I gave before, it will get outside of the building and then it will communicate to the user. Sometimes there is a communication, there is someone there with a tablet. It just want to have one user to run 10 drones. So you don't want to have 10 operators. So you have one operator get only uh, uh, signals that something was found, have a look, uh, have a man in the loop. Uh, it's, it's almost mandatory in, uh, in most places. Um, so that's, uh, it depends on their use case. Hi, uh, thank you for the uh, presentation. It was nice to hear from uh, about the MLOPs. So I have a generalized about your opinion. So you are uh, experienced with the MLOPs. So is can we use Scrum in MLOPs for the development? Yeah. So I I showed I, I showed you before my SDLC. It's uh, agile. Six weeks. We have uh, sprints of two weeks. Uh, so every three sprints we release a version. Yeah. Even. I know that sometimes research guy doesn't like to work in sprints, but even the research work in sprints. Yeah, thank you. Uh, when you have everything on the drone itself, doing all the inference and everything, uh, don't you run into battery problems? Yeah, so obviously that's the, the main problem. So this is why we run on low power chip. I showed before, it's between 5 to 15 watts. So it depends on the platform and uh, how much uh, energy we uh, we take and how much the platform uh, uses the 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 battery. Uh, so obviously, when you add uh, deep learning uh, running on the edge, uh, you uh, you you take down the operation time of the platform. So if it was one hour, maybe now it will be fifteen minutes. Fifty minutes. Uh, even sending the information back, compressing the video, sending it back to, to a communication, it's also con con a consumption of power. So every, everywhere you, you will look at it, you will use some power. We are using as low as possible 
uh, chips to make sure that we don't harm the operation uh, time of the platform or we arm it a little bit. And also we enable the user to decide uh, when to trigger it uh, from remote. So they can decide that uh, flying towards the destination, the, our solution will not work. It will be in, uh, let's say, it's sleep mode. Uh, the GPU is not working. And only when it reaches this, uh, let's get to the example of this finding this guy with the dog. So you send 10 drones. You are not using the, the machine learning uh, algorithms until you reach there. Everyone settles in his own area and only then you operate it. So there are ways to make sure that uh, we, you don't take too much of the battery, but yes, obviously we need some energy. Thank you.